And today we're going to be looking over uh, some specimens. Uh, what makes a specimen a good specimen, and what can make something really cool not really work all that good for a museum specimen. So before I get into that, uh, I do want to thank the Beltrami Electric Co-op and the Roundup program for helping us fund this and also just doing so much for us to make it possible for us to do these live streams. Uh, also, uh, Headwater Science Center is open pretty much seven days a week, 9.30 to 5, and on Sundays, 1 to 5. So feel free to come in whenever you get the chance. There's a lot of stuff here we can show you. So, we're going to have a special guest part of the way through this, and that'll be a little bit of a surprise. So, first thing I want to go over is why do museums keep these collections of things, of, of living beings, and of taxidermied animals and such? And one of the reasons is they're great for keeping records and great for reference. Uh, museums will keep stuff like type specimens so that when people find something, they can use it to identify it. Um, but then the other thing is they'll be used by everyone from, you know, like scientists, to education, to even law enforcement. But for something to be a good specimen, there's going to be a couple requirements it needs. And one of those is a being in good condition. And we've got a great example of something really cool that's not in good condition, which is this great horned owl who has sat in a kind of a smoker's lounge for quite a number of years. And that has stained the feathers, this very dark brown color and made it not really all that useful for using as reference for if you found a random owl on the side of the road, figuring it out because these feathers aren't the correct color. So another one that is really cool, I love this thing, but it's a really bad specimen, is this sea turtle right here. Because it's been used kind of as an art piece. One of the eyes has been replaced by this very bright blue marble. It's been shellacked, so it's a lot shinier than it would be in life. And in general, it's not posed in a way that's going to be really used in a museum for keeping this. Now getting closer to being a good specimen, we've got this pheasant. So this pheasant is very well maintained. It's not been sitting in some lounge where some people are smoking all the time. Its feathers are in good condition. But it is missing a few key things. One of them being a good label, which has information like when it was collected, where it was collected, who collected it, and species name. Because this doesn't really tell you what type of pheasant this is. And we got another two specimens that are in a similar boat, like this turtle shell. This is a really cool, really big turtle shell. I got no clue what kind of turtle this is from, I got no clue where this is from, who found it, when they found it. And for a scientist, if you're going to use this, you need that basic information. Now getting closer to that, we've got this duck. I don't know what species this duck is. And I'm not exactly sure when it was collected. I'm guessing roughly 2006 because of this tag. But that's the only tag that we have on this duck. Other than that, there's really not a lot of context to this. So from there, though, we do get in to the really good specimens we have here, which we have these yellow warbler nests, which came with a very good label for both of them, and one of them even was individually labeled. And this label tells us when this was found, where this was found, even tells us the time of year, and tells us information like what birds were in this. Yellow warblers are susceptible to what's called nest parasitism, and typically by cowbirds, and the, the tag even tells us there were no cowbirds in this nest at the time of its collection, nor were there any eggshells. Now getting to the next one down the line is not the most exciting thing, but it's a raccoon skull, which, looking at this, was collected in October in 79. And it tells us where it was, let's see by Polk, Minnesota, and even has the coordinates. And actually, we got our special guest coming in right here. So this is Angel, 
So Angel, oh hello, are you gonna go in my hand or no? So Angel here is a blue-fronted Amazon or a blue-fronted parrot. There's a few different common names for these birds. And another thing that museums will keep is living specimens. So that would be actually living animals, places like zoos, science museums like the Science Center, and other places will have these because they're a great way to see behavior and so we can see the animal in motion. Sometimes that gives us information that we wouldn't get from just a stuffed dead duck. An angel here is just a very, very friendly bird to you if she'll let me pet her. She might be a little bit camera shy. And we got some snacks here to keep her interested. So while she gets settled in, we'll go over these last two specimens. So what we got here is a metal a meadow vole with a very good tag. And you can see all of that information on that. It tells us even what type of specimen this is, which is a skin, skull, and stuffed animal. And then we have a short-tailed shrew here with the same type of very, very detailed tag. And this is actually something that, oh, so this one uh, was at one point in the Bemidji State University collection, actually. So that's a great thing to know. So I'm actually a student there, and they have a great vertebrate collection going. But the big thing for scientists is with these specimens, we can tell stuff about animals, how they changed over time. You can measure stuff. And they make it really, really convenient for scientists to have these long-running records. But yeah, so then the other thing is how we classify them. So if Angel here... Oh, hello. So Angel... Would basically be a great way for us to show you taxon. So I'm going to have to pull out my notes for this. So, when we're classifying animals, we use a system called taxonomy, which has different layers of classification. So, angel would be in the kingdom animalia, which means an animal. You know, mammals, reptiles, birds, insects, all of that. An angel is a great example of the phylum chordata having a spine. Not necessarily a backbone, but a spine. And in the class of avis, so birds, Order for her, and this is where I got my notes, is Pisitichiformes. I'm sure my ornithology professor is quite upset with my mispronunciation there. And that is what we call parrots. So the families of that, there's three of them, which would be cockatoos, which is the common name for one family, the New Zealand parrots, and then what we call true parrots, which is what Angel here would be in order. Now, then, going down from that, from order, we go to family. Now, let's see. So that would be the true parrots. And then we have genus, which for genus is going to be for her, is Amazona. So there's a few other, other parrots in that family of Amazona. All of them happen to be found in the Amazon. And her species is Aestiva. And that is how we narrow it down, because this bird, uh, the blue-fronted parrot, has a lot of common names, actually, uh, from the blue-fronted Amazon, the teal Amazon, the turquoise-fronted parrot. There's a lot of common names, and when there's a lot, that many common names, it's good to have one scientific name, which is what scientists would use. So here, yeah, let's see if Angel will walk on my hand here. So this is the other thing. Angel is a pretty habituated bird. She actually didn't hurt me all that much. That was just a little bit of a personal space bite. Um, but yeah, no, from now we can leave that actually there for the taxonomy bit, and we can actually get back into another show, probably, just on Angel here, because there's a lot of cool stuff about parrots, especially when you look at them with birds as a whole. So yeah, everyone feel free to stop by the Science Center any day, and come on in and see Angel and all the other animals we have here, as well as